name is Amy Starczewski, and I direct the Oral History Master of Arts program here at Columbia. Um, tonight's event, as most of you know, is part of our year-long series on oral history and the future, archives and embodied memory. Um, and we're looking at this topic through kind of three lenses. One is like, what is an archive? Is it an institutional place where we keep our oral history safe? Is it an embodied space where we tell our stories to people and expect them to remember them and in turn tell them to other people? Um, and this, this talk is part of sort of the third strand where we're thinking about now that we've been doing oral history in this kind of formalized way of recording oral histories and putting them into archives for decades, what is the afterlife of these archives? And it's a question that's really coming up more and more in the field. What does it mean to use other people's oral histories? What does it mean to have your oral histories used by other people? Um, and this is a really, really exciting case of an oral history archive that sat and was well cared for for decades, 30 years. Um, and now it's being brought back to life in one version of the future for which it was created. And I could see it having you know, a totally different afterlife 100 years from now, too. Um, and so I'm so, so, so pleased to welcome Eric Marcus to the series. Um, he is, of course, the creator and host of the award-winning, including the Oral History Association uh, non-print non media award. Here's the um, uh, 2017 award for oral history in a non-print format. In a non-print format. <laughs> I can say, as an Oral History Association insider, the, the title of that award has been debated because it sounds so. It sounds so. Uh, but what else? Like we, yeah, yeah. What else? We, but yeah. If anyone has better ideas for that award, please share them, and I can pass them on. Um, his other books uh, include "Is It a Choice? Why Suicide?" and "Breaking the Surface: The Number One New York Times Bestselling Autobiography of Olympic Diving Champion Greg Luganis. Uh, Harper Collins recently republished the 1992 edition of Making Gay History in an ebook under the original title, Making History The Struggle for Gay and Lesbian People Rights, 1945 to 1990. Um, and the title changed it. Like, yeah, so it's so, I'm so happy to be able to have this chance to really think about um, what is it like to re listen to these interviews uh, in the present moment. Thank you for being here. I'm going to pass around the sign-in sheet in case anyone's not on our mailing list and would like to be. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you all for being here. And thank you for having me tonight. Um, <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. It's very, it's so rare that I get to talk. Uh, I've never talked to a group of people do it. Um, but I didn't know I that I do what I did until I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, so just a, an aside about the title of the book, the original title of the book was Making History. Um, my editor was concerned, and it was a realistic concern, that in 1992, when the book was published, that the salespeople at Harper and Row, now Harper Collins, would have trouble selling a book with the word gay in the title, and that bookstores would have problems putting the book face out with the word gay in the title. So we kept it in the subtitle. When the book was published in the second edition 10 years later, the world had changed a lot already, and so we put the word gay in the, in the title. Um, I'm often asked now, why do I call my podcast Making Gay History, not Making LGBTQ History? Um, because the name of the book is Making Gay History. That's why. It's my own <laughs> brand. Um, it's not meant to be exclusionary. It is of its moment. And when I published, when my book was published under Making Gay History, it was a big deal. Now it's, you know, who cares? Um, just as another aside, on the back of a book, you see um, in the top left-hand corner shelving instructions. And I was very determined that it would say beyond gate, it would always say gate interest, that it would say American history. They didn't do that for the first edition. In the second edition, I got them to do it. Instead of, uh, I got a proof of the jacket, which is the final version you get before it goes to the printer. Um, and then the book was published. And somehow, between the proof and publication, American history disappeared. And it just said gay interest. And no one at HarperCollins would, would fess up to what happened. Um, because it wasn't seen as a legitimate piece of American history, as it is now. So we're going to do a few things tonight. I'm going to address some of the things that um, are in the topic description of this talk, um, which includes how I came to mind my own archive. Um, uh, but a lot of this will be about the archive and the voices from the archive, which I think is much more interesting than the story of how the archive came about. So we'll have a, a sample of what's there. Um, it comes out of the, the podcast. 
Uh, but very quickly, the way this came about was, so I did this book, commissioned in 1988. I conducted most of the interviews between 1988 and 1990 for the first edition. I did, I think, about 80 interviews. <clears throat> and I did um, 20 more for the second edition, which was published in 2002. So those interviews were con I conducted between 1999 and 2000. Uh, I was crazy obsessive compulsive about the interviews. I made copies immediately after doing the first interviews. I kept the second copy in a different location. This is all cassette tapes. I kept the, se the second copy in a different location in case anything happened to the first set. I felt very responsible for the people whose stories I collected. Um, a lot of them were older, and a lot of them, a lot of the men were dying of AIDS, and then died soon after I interviewed them. So I felt these were important stories. The best accident during that time was that I was working at CBS News when I started working on the book, and I was commissioned to do the book. And I asked my boss, Jay Curtis, who had created Morning Edition and Weekend Edition for NPR, what do your colleagues use to record their stories? And he put me in touch with one of his colleagues, and I bought the most up to date Sony deck um, and used lapel mics. So I wound up recording these interviews with broadcast quality equipment. And I used the best um, audio tape at the time, and then carefully stored it all those years. Um, and in 2008, thinking that my gay work was done because I devalued my gay work, which is a whole other story, because of my internalized homophobia. Um, I don't want to do broader work. I don't want to just do gay work. So I'm a journalist, not a gay journalist. So um, I gave, and I was just sick of gay stuff. So I gave all of my um, my papers and all of my recorded interviews to the New York Public Library. With the stip and they were interested in having my collection with the stipulation that they digitize the entire collection. Fast forward to 2015, and I got fired from my job at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. That's a whole other story, which I, don't, I won't talk about here, but happy to talk about another thing. Um, and I was in my mid-50s and having to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. And as most of you who are older probably know, getting a staff job when you're in your mid-50s is pretty hopeless. So, and I worked for myself for most of my career and really hated working in a corporate structured environment. So I did what you do. I had conversations with lots of people about what I might do with the rest of my life and also looked at what my assets were. And one key asset I had was this archive of 100 interviews that I had done all those years ago. But one of the people I met with was a guy named Kevin Jennings, who was then the executive director of the Arcus Foundation, who had founded Listen, the Game Lesbian Straight Education Network. Um, and had been a longtime friend. He invited me to speak at a conference in Boston on gay history in the early 90s, soon after my book was published, when he was a history teacher um, at the Convent Academy. So I met with Kevin and said, I've got this archive, I'm not sure what to do with it. I think there's something there. Um, and he said, I don't know what you'll do with it. I know people you should talk to, but I'm interested in funding whatever it is you do if, if I can. So um, this is the short version of the story. Mm. So he introduced me to someone at StoryCorps who introduced me to two women who had just founded a nonprofit that was developing curriculum materials that were LGBT inclusive, K-12, and uh, were very interested in using excerpts of my archive uh, as part of their curriculum materials. So I asked my neighbor, who had been a, a producer for the BBC, if she could cut tape. I knew nothing about that. And besides which, it wasn't taped. Um, <laughs> one little piece of this was that I called the New York Public Library after I was fired to find out whether they had finally digitized my collections. I checked in every now and then because I didn't, I wanted this collection to be safe for posterity, and they they didn't have the money to digitize it. And um, and I called final digit, last digit effort to say, if you haven't digitized it, I'll pay for it. Just get it done. They had just finished digitizing the collection. Um, so I asked my neighbor, Sarah Birmingham, if she could cut tape. She said, yes, I can, but I need to hear what it is first. Because she said, as I learned later, she said, most tape is shit, speaking language. Um, that people didn't re record it well enough to be used for anything. Um, but it turned out that I had recorded it properly. And she started cutting pieces. There were supposed to be three or five minute pieces that were anchored with lesson plan. And when we got down to about 10 to 15 minutes, thinking we cannot cut these any further, she said, this sounds like a podcast. Long story short, we launched a podcast not knowing exactly what we were doing. But we had great help uh, from people who took us under uh, under their wings, especially uh, Jenna Weiss Berman from Pineapple Street Media, who uh, 
and one of the hottest production companies produces all kinds of podcasts. So I found myself in the position of mining my own archive, um, which is something I never expected to do. When I recorded the interviews, I thought one day, a scholar, a student, people like you might go to my archive and do these interviews. I had no expectation I would be the person to do it. Um, I didn't think that my my final chapter of my career would be going back to the gay work that I value. Um, that it turns out now has value, um, and I feel better about because I'm not quite as homophobic as I used to be. <laughs> and then hearing these stories again, and having the opportunity to bring these stories to life through the voices of the people who lived it, as opposed to translating their oral histories into print, which required lots of editing so that it could sound in print like they sounded on tape. Um, because as all of you know from doing oral histories, and most of you, raw transcript is very hard to read. Um, so all the interviews in my, my book were deconstructed and reconstructed so that anyone uh, who gave me an oral history would recognize these stories as being their voice. But it wasn't raw transcript. So now I had the opportunity to revisit those original tapes, deconstruct and reconstruct them, because you again can't do raw tape and you can't give someone a three hour interview. Um, but now I've had the privilege of sharing these stories again, but in the voice of the people who live it, not in my voice, not with my translation. Um, although again, filtered through me because these are edited pieces. The experience of hearing these stories as opposed to reading them is um, exponentially more powerful, at least in my experience and I think for my listeners, than reading these stories. Because the in print, you don't get the inflection. You don't get the long pauses. I'll give you one example. Um, in the book, I have an interview with Morty Manford, who with his mother founded, co-founded P-Flag, a thing called Parents, Families and Friends of Lesbian and Gays, um, in the early 70s. There was a, uh, a point in the interview, and I only know this because I heard, I listened to the tape again, but it's not in the book, and I've forgotten this was even there. I'm in his car, he's about to drive me home, still recording, he was driving me to the train station, and I thought Morty was, I thought Morty had AIDS, but I was afraid to ask him to rent. Morty was in his 30s at the time, late 30s, I was just and in the sequence of questions, you can hear me, or I can hear myself, trying to ask Morty every which way about whether he had AIDS, but not asking him directly. I just couldn't do it. And I ask him one question where there's a really long pause. And in my notes from later, which I went back to look at after I sort of listened to the audio again, in the notes, I, I note that his eyes filled with tears. I hadn't taking those notes right after the interview, I never would have known that. So I'm able to say, I think in the conclusion for the few seconds, I say that his eyes filled with tears. But in the audio, you can hear this long pause. And you can hear in his voice a sadness that made clear to me at the time, um, and from listening to it again, was that he likely did have AIDS. His sister is still alive. I could call her, I did call her, and say, when did Morty know that he was HIV positive? At least that he was positive. It was two weeks before I interviewed him. In the book, that's, that's not even in the book, because you, how do you translate a long pause into a, an oral history transcript uh, or an edited transcript? Um, and it was my executive producer, I think, who said, Oh, what? She said, Oh my God, I couldn't believe that, what that sounded like. And I said, What? What, what, what was it? And so she, she played it. Um, and I can't listen to that without crying. Um, I had, um, just as another aside, I know I can get to some, some of the audio. Um, I was commissioned to do this book after I submitted a proposal. They bought the book. I was commissioned to do it. Um, I started work on it in December, the actual interview was in December of 1988. Um, I got tested for HIV in November of 88, early November. I waited, I don't know if you're familiar with what that era was like. Doctors uh, were recommending that you not get tested. Yet. At least there were some who argued you shouldn't get tested because there was no treatment for HIV. Um, and that the anxiety around being HIV positive once they were test was worse than not knowing. That, that, that could suppress your immune system further. Uh, 
So I decided I won't get tested until there was a treatment that was proven to be somewhat effective. And I was a, a subscriber, I was a science geek, still am, and I subscribed to Scientific American. Um, and there was a cover story in the fall of 1988 in Scientific American, all about, it was a whole issue about AIDS, and there was an article about how AZT was proving to be somewhat effective in slowing the disease down. So my partner and I decided to get tested. I was 30, or 29. I got tested early in November. I already got the contract to write this book. I find it hard to tell this story. Um, this was 30 years ago. And um, I got tested before my 30th birthday, which is November 12, 1980. And uh, the test then took three weeks to get the results back. So we had my, my part, then partner gave me a big 30th birthday party. And I, I assumed I was positive. I just wanted to live long enough to do this book. Um, and it was Thanksgiving that I got the test results. My partner both me. Because I'd made a deal with God, even though I didn't believe with God, that if you just let me live long enough to do this book, I would do a good book. Um, I had no idea I would live to this age, I'll be 60 in four weeks, that I would get to tell these stories all over again. And I feel an enormous responsibility to my people who entrusted me with their stories. Um, one of whom was Morty Manford, who, who told his mother later that he thought no one would ever remember his contributions to the movement. Um, she told me this in the last weeks of his life. She called me to tell me about this. And I said, I've got the bound galleys for the, for the book. Would you like to read it this chapter? And he so couldn't read it at that point. He was on deathbed. And so she read this chapter. Uh, and uh, there were plenty of stories like that. People who never thought that their stories would be remembered. Um, and were very eager to tell me their stories for that reason. So I felt this enormous responsibility to tell their story. So when you came in, you, were, you heard music. I don't know if you heard the lyrics to any of these, these uh, songs, but that person is Edith Hyde. I should stop for a second. Does anyone have questions before we go to some of the audio? I'll go to the audio. Um, and I'll ask myself questions if you don't have. <laughs> this is Lisa Ben, and the songs you heard her singing were songs that she wrote in the 1950s and 60s, either her own songs or new lyrics, gay lyrics, to um, songs that that was just more popular songs at the time. Uh, Edith was one of the, her real name is Edith I, AKA Lisa Ben. Anyone play word games? If you know what Lisa Ben spells? <laughs> lesbian. Oh. So she wrote for the latter, which was an early lesbian publication, the first, um, actually she published the first lesbian uh, zine in 1947. Later wrote for um, the latter in the 1950s and 60s. And she couldn't write under her own name. No one wrote under their own name. And the pseudonym she came up with was Ima Spinster. <laughs> and the editor objected to that name. She said she didn't have a sense of humor. So she came up with Lisa Ben. So Lisa Ben published the first newsletter, the first zine, what we would call a zine, she called it a magazine, in 1947. She had a job at RKO Radio Pictures in Hollywood, young secretary. And her boss told her to look busy, even when she wasn't, didn't have work from him. He said, but don't read, don't come in. So if you were a lesbian in 1947 working for RK or Radio Pictures, um, and you didn't know any of the lesbians, what would you do? She decided she would do a magazine for lesbians. But she typed on her typewriter at the office using five carbons. She, does, does everyone know what carbon paper is? <laughs> <laughs> so carbon paper is used. Um, uh, I'm actually serious. Does anyone, uh, <laughs> is there anyone here who doesn't know what carbon paper is? Don't be shy. Yeah. Okay. So to make copies, um, it was hard to make copies. So there was something called carbon paper, which allowed you to sandwich it between two sheets of paper, or three or four. Um, and when you put it in your typewriter and typed, um, it would, it would uh, the impression would go through all the pages and you would have multiple copies. So she typed it through using five sheets of carbon paper. So she typed it through twice and had 10 copies of every edition of what she called Vice Versa, America's Gayest Magazine. Um, at a time when people didn't use the word gay, at least it was inside work at the time. Those are all available on my website if you go to Lisa Ben's interview, Edith Ide's interview. There's a link to uh, a website where you can look at all the editions of her magazine. Uh, so she published 
She published Vice Versa, she did, I think, 10 issues in 1947. And in one of the essays, she talks about what the world she imagines will exist one day for people like her. And let me just double check my introduction to see where, where she comes in. Um, Ah, so she she uh, will talk about. Uh, uh, I talk. I, I thought of her as a fortune teller, that she imagined a world that was unimaginable in 1947. And let's see what she has to say. It was just some writing that I wanted to do to get it off my chest, and I was a very lonely person, and I could sort of fantasize this way by uh, writing the magazine, you see. And uh, then, uh, oh, I'd write the the end, the what the whatchama column. And that was just ideas that happened off the top of my head that I would write about and say, wouldn't it be wonderful if, not fantasize exactly, but imagine imagine about how things might be in the future with us. What were some of the things you imagined? Well, I imagined that perhaps we would have a lot of magazines <laughs> and that perhaps even movies might be made about us. I would hope that someday we would not be looked down on with so much disdain. Well, I think this may be where you, this is the column, it's, uh, this is the article, Here to Stay, September 1947, Volume 1, Number 4. Whether the unsympathetic majority approves or not, it looks as though the third sex is here to stay. With the advancement of psychiatry and related subjects, the world is becoming more and more aware that there are those in our midst who feel no attraction for the opposite sex. Homosexuality is becoming less and less a taboo subject. And although still considered by the general public as contemptible or treated with derision, I venture to predict that there will be a time in the future when gay folk will be accepted as part of regular society. That's pretty bold stuff. Well, I guess it is. I never thought of it as being, uh, being bold at the time. I was just, uh, as I say, I was just sort of fantasizing. But it all has come to pass. <laughs> so that's Edith and I. I interviewed her on her front porch um, in uh, Burbank, California. When I, uh, it was a little cottage that she bought with savings from her job as a secretary. Uh, and she had 13 cats. 13. <laughs> um, and the reason she, we did the interview on the front porch, I didn't realize why until we walked into the house. You know, asked with 13 cats. <laughs> um, uh, and this is a dilemma that you may face in your work. When people say things that could be misunderstood or say things that, that, that they might want to read in print, what do you do with them? So Edith was upset with me when she read the, her chapter in the book. And she talks about having 13 pussies. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you use that? That is what she said, and that's how she referred to her cats. But seeing in her print, she was upset with me. <laughs> and, I, and I might have been. I, I, we debated it also when we did the episode with her. Do we do we leave that in or not? Um, because she was upset with me at the time. Uh, my executive producer said to me, "How did you know to read that essay so that you would have it to use in the podcast 30 years later?" And I said, "I don't know. I just thought to, to read it because I wasn't sure I'd ever get a copy of that from anybody." Um, I also recorded about. 20 or 30 minutes and he had seen her songs. And Sarah also said, she said, you were writing a book, why would you have her sing? I said, because I, just, I didn't know she was, that she did these songs and I thought, I'll hear her sing. And so I have um, two of the best recordings that I've seen in her music. Uh, there was a single that she had done on a 45 record. Um, I haven't been able to find one, um, but it exists somewhere. So that's Edith. Um, Edith is a real challenge to find because her pseudonym was Lisa Ben. I didn't, you couldn't just Google Lisa, Lisa Ben. I think it took 25 phone calls to find her. Um, and I don't know how many weeks. And on the 25th call, I may have been the 18th call or the 28th call, I don't remember exactly. Um, she picked up the phone and said, hello. And I said, is this Lisa Ben? And she said, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, ah, I found you. <laughs> so um, that was a real struggle for me in finding people. Um, and I didn't always use people who I found. The next person I'm going to play a little piece for, uh, from is a guy named Wendell Sayers. In the book, um, um, and Marina in the front row has the original book, where Wendell Sayers is Paul Phillips. Because Wendell, when I interviewed him in the, in the mid 80s, said he didn't want his real name used in case they got back to his relatives in Western Kansas that he was gay. 
was so fearful of anyone knowing that he would shame them um, uh, knowing that he was gay. I didn't set out to interview Michael. I um, knew that I wanted to interview someone in Denver from the 1950s. I'd read that there was a, a convention of an organization called, um, it was called the North, uh, NACO, the North American Conference of Homophile Organizations. And they had a conference in the late 50s in, in Denver. I couldn't believe that there was a, a convention of gay rights organizations in the late 50s. So I called, um, so how do you find someone who can talk about that if, you, if, it's, if there's no historical record? Other than you read somewhere, which I did in one of the, in the One History book, that there was a convention in the 50s in Denver. So I called the gay bookstore in Denver, the guys who owned it, the gay couple. I interviewed them for my first book, The Male Couple's Guide. And I said, do you know anybody who was involved with the Madison Society, this early gay rights organization in the 1950s? And they said, you got to talk to Elver Barker. And I called Elver Barker and uh, arranged to interview him. And now I can't remember whether I actually interviewed him or not. But Elver said, well, there's someone else you should talk to when you're here. His name is Wendell Sayers. Um, he was involved with Mattachine. We had a big falling out. Um, also, he was one of the only uh, African Americans involved. He was the word black in 1988. One of the only black who was involved in, at all in the movement in those days. So he gave me Wendell's number. And um, I called Wendell, and Wendell's story was extraordinary. Um, so many of the stories I tell in Making Gay History were little stories, um, stories that were not necessarily about people who had big roles in the movement, but people who did things that were extraordinary given who they were and their moment in time. Um, so I have to read Wendell's story in the book or listen to the podcast to find out what he what he did, which was simply going to TV um, and trying also to save the neck of a kid who got caught up with pornography on the feeds. Um, what I'm going to play for you is a clip from Wendell's interview um, that's really a deeply personal story about what happened to him um, uh, when he was a teenager. And it's not a story that changed the world, but it, it's a small story that gave context to um, what gay people, what gay men, what gay women, if it wasn't LGBTQ then, what people faced in those days. Um, just because of who they were. So when uh, Wendell was 16, he was sent to, um, let me just see where, what clip I'm gonna play. Wendell's uh, father sent him to the Mayo Clinic um, in 1920. Wendell was 16, to be diagnosed as a homosexual. We lived in Western Kansas, and um, let me play the clip for you. And I have something to say. Oh, this is after he's been diagnosed as a homosexual and uh, thinking about what's going to happen when he goes home. Diagnosed? Yes. Um, yes, diagnosed. Homosexuality was considered a sickness. So we went back home and reported to bed. And I say this that I was a, an adopted child. Mm -hmm. And I often used to wonder as a kid, what would he do when he finds it out, see? Would he put me out or kick me out or would he accept me? My dad was very understanding. I say understanding, I don't think he actually understood, but he was willing to accept, I should say. So he finally told me, he says, well, since they don't know what to do about it, Find you a friend that you can trust and bring him home. Says, I don't want you playing around on the streets or out on the country roads because you never know who's going to step up behind you or step up on you. Bring him home. What you do in your room is your business. Because they didn't want me out on the street. There are a couple of things that shocked me about Wendell's story, and this is just a little teeny piece of it. I didn't know anybody was sent to the Mayo Clinic in 1920 to be diagnosed as a homosexual. I didn't realize that there were people whose parents accepted them as best they could, and, and his father wanted him to be safe um, in a world that was not safe for young black men. Um, certainly not on the streets and not for a homosexual kid. 
Um, there's, there are also things, I ask stupid questions um, um, of a lot of people. And I think as all historians, you have to be prepared to ask stupid questions and then apologize um, if someone's offended. But actually, no one was ever offended, I would say. No, I, I just didn't know. So, I, so Wendell told me that um, when they drove to uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, he said, we, we slept on the side of the road and we bought food at, at, at uh, groceries. And I said, well, why? Why, why didn't you stay with us? Good question. Um, he said, because there were no hotels where black folks could stay. Um, and we couldn't eat at restaurants. We could go in and take food out. Um, and I learned, I, I was just, it was stunning to me and horrifying. So he offered a window into a world that I really didn't know much about. Um, when I was leaving the interview with Wendell, I remember it was this very um, powerfully built man. Um, uh, he wore a white shirt, tie, polished shoes, gray slats. He had been a, an attorney. He was the first black person, black man to work at, uh, as an attorney for the state attorney general in Denver. Now, in the book, the original book, I don't identify what state he lived in. Um, so that was a debate also when we did this episode of the podcast. Would we out Wendell? or not, and um, it was a difficult decision to make. And the decision I, we all made uh, as a team was that Wendell trusted me with the story and that I had to assume he would be proud of the fact that the story was being told and being told using his real name. He hasn't come back to haunt me yet. Um, and maybe it was the wrong decision. Um, but I like to think it was the right one. Um, could be the wrong one. So as I was leaving Wendell's house, I was standing on the front step. He said, he lived alone and spent most of his life alone. Um, and his two friends at, his, at church who knew that he was gay had both died of AIDS. So he was very isolated, as were many of the people I interviewed for the book, um, especially the older folks. And he said, do you think it's too late for me to meet someone? Um, and I think that's why I always remember the interview with Wendell. Um, in my heart, I knew that it was too late. That he was so isolated. The odds of him meeting anyone, anyone were really remote. And he said, not for sex. He said, it's too late for that. He said, just for companionship. And I said, um, I lied. I said, it's never too late. Um, but I, I really thought it was that he would, he would like to die alone. Um, he died in, at page 93. Um, and his whole story is just so moving. And we only get a snippet of it in the, in the podcast. The heartbreak of doing the podcast, and there isn't much heartbreak about it. With the book, I used about 5 or 10% of every interview. With the podcast, I used 5 or 10% of what's in the book. Um, because you just can't, you can't tell a lot of stories. Um, so with the podcast, you get a taste of the book. The original edition, you get more. The second edition of the book, I cut the stories way down. Um, so that's, um, that's what um, very small moment in history, offering a big window into a time that's so distant. And also in his voice, you hear him use language that people don't use anymore. Um, in, the, in the piece in the podcast, you hear him use, say, Oshchus and other, other language that people just don't use today. <coughs> then there are big stories, big personalities. Sylvia Rivera. How many of you have ever heard of Sylvia Rivera? Uh, how many of you have ever heard Sylvia's voice? <laughs> um, I forgot what Sylvia sounded like, and I forgot the heavy New York accent, um, and was astonished when I heard Sylvia. I used to have a heavy New York accent. I thought it was something that would hold me back in life, so I worked very hard in college to get rid of my accent. Um, and we, whenever I slip in the podcast, when we record, it's not in, you won't hear it in the, in the podcast. <laughs> um, there are things that I struggle with. What's the one I always struggle with? Always. Um, I, it's because I always say always. Um, I was I thought it was I was really classist, and I thought it was more classist than the other accent. Um, anyway, Sylvia has this glorious accent, um, and I'll play the piece, a little piece from Sylvia's interview. Uh, Sylvia is only 17 years old in this picture. It was taken by and we forget how young Sylvia was at the time of Stonewall, 17. Um, she's going to be 18 here. Um, as we're all the street kids at Stonewall that night, they range in age from 17 to 21. Uh, so, let me play this. 
to be there, you know, it's just like, oh, it's so beautiful. I just like, you know, it's like. Is it exciting? Oh, it's so exciting. It was like, oh, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're, we're fucking nerds. <laughs> the cops were, you know, they, they just panicked. Inspector Pine really panicked. He really did. <laughs> Plus, he had no backup. Mm -hmm. He knew. He did not expect any of the retaliation that the gay community gave him at that point. Do you think all this was in part because people were so angry for so long? People were very angry for so long. I mean, how long can you live in a car? Um. Sylvia was probably the scariest interview for me um, because I was 30. I had never met a drag queen, someone who a self-described drag queen before. Um, she lived in still forgetting which town or Terry Town in a tenement in a rough part of town. Um, and I remember standing at the bottom, and I took all these notes, thank goodness I stood at the bottom of the stairs of her tenement. She was rang me in the building, and there was Sylvia at the top of the stairs, looking scared um, <laughs> to me. And um, as I said to the class earlier, I thought of myself as a short gay Jew who grew up in a really isolated community in Queens, the Iowa of Queens. So I had never had any experience interviewing someone like that. Um, so it wasn't until I got up the stairs and into the kitchen and sat down and Sylvia was making chili and her boyfriend was there and her best friend Rennie. And it was a moment of realizing, well, they're just people too. Um, so I learned a lot through the process of doing, doing this project about people. And I had my prejudices and expectations of what, what people were like. Um, there's a point I want to make about Sylvia and this interview and one of the challenges of oral history as I've explained to many people uh, over time, oral history isn't necessarily fact. Oral history is history as people remember it, or history as they wish it to be remembered, or history as they wish to be in it. Um, because it's not clear that Sylvia was actually at the first night of the Stonewall Uprising. Um, one of the definitive works on Stonewall was written by David Carter, and David has said to me, why is Sylvia why do you say in your podcast that's and your book that Sylvia was there the first night? She was not. Okay, well, David, um, this is Sylvia's story, and and I always make clear oral history is, is history as people remember it, and I'm not going to go to speak Sylvia. This is what Sylvia's memory is of it. People have your book, and they can see there what you found, um, and Sylvia tells a great story. So it is one of the challenges of oral history. And one of the exciting pieces for me in doing these interviews was occasionally the stories would intersect. And one, people would, one person would tell the other person the same story from a different perspective. Um, and Stonewall is separate because there were so many people involved. I've had many perspectives on that. But I remember Frank Kennedy, who founded the Madison Society of Washington, D.C., said, tell me how the FBI was there at their founding meeting in Washington, D.C. I remember thinking, He's a little paranoid, and Frank was a really weird guy. That's a very judgmental word. Frank was somewhere on the spectrum. Um, and I didn't know there was such things as spectrum when I interviewed Frank in 1988. I just knew he was this crazy scientist who, who um, gestured fiercely um, and uh, was a really important person in the movement. So Frank talked about the FBI, the FBI being in his first meeting and challenging the FBI agent, uh, who we recognized to be a, an agent. And, and I was skeptical of the story. And then um, Randy Schultz, who wrote Anna Van Played On, who was a mentor of mine, gave me all of his FBI documents from a book he was working on. And there in the FBI files was Agent Fouchette's report from that first meeting in 1961, um, where Frank Campbell uh, was and told the story. Um, but oral history is 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 what it is. It's people's recollections, um, and all of us remember our histories. So, one key thing that came out of, of the Sylvia story was this issue of anger, um, and how angry people were, and how motivated they were by anger about 
motivated they, they were by anger. Um, and this next clip is from Joyce Plunger. Um, if any of you recognize her name, she was the co-founder of the Harvey Milk High School. She was also the co-organizer of the 79 March on Washington. Um, she's still alive, she's 80. Um, and I'll play her clip now. One of the things that the movement did for me, it gave me a vehicle to express my anger. What were you angry about? Everything. That I had been denied my life, that I had no adolescence. My childhood was, uh, was robbed. I always say that when I come back in the next life, I want to come out at two, and I want to be able to enjoy being who I am. <laughs> Um, we've had, we've gotten to do some public events together, and she's treated like a rock star. Uh, <laughs> there aren't a lot of people who are still alive from that period of time. She was the, uh, uh, the to use the old phrase, she was the illegitimate child of a 16-year-old old Dutch Jewish mother and African-American father. Grew up in the projects, actually she grew up mostly in foster care. Badly abused by her father, um, tried to kill herself a couple of times. Sent to a psychiatrist who said yeah, you should get married and have children. That will take care of your feelings of it toward women. It didn't work out so well. Um, uh, she dropped out of high school. She went on to get her GED, her um, uh, her college uh, degree, a master's degree, a PhD. Um, in, in no small part because she was gay bash uh, when she was in her twenties. But that's a whole other story. You'll hear about. It. She's really one of, one of my heroes and went on to do extraordinary things. That is Joyce at the um, Patrick Martin Institute, what is now known as HMI, what was originally known as the Institute for Protection of Western Naked Youth, founded by Henry Hedrick and David Martin, both of whom died of AIDS, and I got to interview both of them. Um, and she's talking to a couple of kids there. Um, I love Next up is Perry Watkins. Anyone ever hear of Perry Watkins? So my executive producer early on was listening to the archive, and she called me up and said, oh my god, Perry Watkins is extraordinary. I said, Perry who? And she said, Perry Watkins, you interviewed him. I said, I did? Um, because Perry's not in the book. And Perry gave one of the densest interviews of anyone I interviewed. By dense, I mean he spoke very fast. Much faster than I talk. So transcribing, I did all my own transcriptions. I didn't have enough money to hire someone to do transcriptions. And it's brutal doing transcripts, as all of you know. So I, I, I must have looked at Perry's interview and thought, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to transcribe this interview. And I already had someone else who could tell the story of being in the military and being thrown out of the military. Um, so Sarah said, Perry Watkins' story is amazing. And she said, you talked about how cool this house was. I went back and looked at my notes, and then it came back to me. Um, so I'm going to play um, an excerpt from my interview with Perry Watkins. His problem wasn't coming out. Joyce's problem was coming out. His problem wasn't coming out. He was out from the time he was in high school. Um, and I don't tell this, this story. Is the, uh, uh, we talk about being in high school, and we don't go into the details in the podcast because um, <coughs> for a broad market, and the story of how he came out was that um, one of the kids, we're all adults, I can, well, we're in live streaming, aren't we? <laughs> I'll tell you the story after. So anyway, he was, he was really out um, and got drafted into the U.S. military. Even though he was out about being gay, even though he checked the box, this was the Vietnam War here in 1968, checked the box about being homosexual, he still drafted. I was not trying to go into the military. That's why I told them I was, that's why I find it absolutely ludicrous that the Army is in court saying, we don't want this man anymore. Well, why the hell did you take me? <laughs> and why am I the one that is being accused of being at fault? It is amazing, but no, I checked the box, yes. They sent me in to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. who said to me, why did you check this box, yes? And I went, because you asked me to fill the form out honestly. Well, do you object to going to the military? No, I didn't want to go in the military. Who did? Right. But I certainly had no objection to serving my country. You were raised to be honest. Extremely so. Why I really checked the box was because I thought, if I go into the military, 
I'm not going to hide the fact that I'm gay. I know myself well enough to know that. So when I get thrown out, mom will be angry if I lie. Mm. That was why I checked the box. When I get put out of the room, mom will be more angry with me for lying then why didn't I just tell the damn truth to begin with? Mm -hmm. So, um, anyone want to guess how many years Perry served in the military? 15 years. With an exemplary record. Um, and they went after him only after he challenged them for taking away his security clearance for the fourth time. Um, when someone recognized him that he was gay and uh, took away his security clearance, and he just decided he would challenge him. That's when they decided to throw him out. It was no secret he was, he was gay. He had a, he, had a um, he performed as Simone in drag for the troops. So, um, uh, and Perry said, um, this is what he said to me when he was in a podcast episode. So that when a black man checked the box that he was homosexual, he was shipped out, and when when a white guy did, he'd be sent home. And Perry said the reason the military was fine with having an openly gay black man be drafted was that they thought he'd be coming back in a body bag from Vietnam. And he wondered what the actual statistics were on this. And I think that I hope it's a graduate student who hears this episode of the podcast and decides to go back and research what actually happened. Um, so Perry uh, survived the military um, and was thrown out. And after a nine-year court battle, he was the first gay person to be reinstated. Um, but he died of AIDS in 1996, so he didn't get to enjoy his, uh, his role as a, as a trailblazer. Um, but he said he had, not, he, said, uh, he had not chosen to be a trailblazer. He said he had no choice but to stand up and fight because it was the right thing to do. Here is one of my heroes, and I'm so glad I've had the opportunity now to tell this story in a podcast because I didn't in the book. So I, can, I, I feel less guilty. Um, and many more people listen to the podcast than ever read the book. That's one of the great things about the work you do, is with oral history and podcasts, there's the opportunity to share these stories with a much wider audience. Even back in the old days, people didn't buy that many books. The Making Day History book, in its two editions, sold a total of 35,000 copies, which is a lot for a history book, especially a narrow market book. We've had nearly 2 million episode downloads from 211 countries and, and territories around the world. So the podcast format, audio, is a way to share your stories um, in a way that, that you can't be clear. Um Next up, um, so standing up, as Perry did, takes many forms. And um, this next clip um, is from Dear Abby. How many of you know who Dear Abby was? So, so for people of my generation, Dear Abby was the person who provided advice um, to everybody. Um, she and her sister were twins, and they wrote competing columns advice columns about everything. And Dear Abby, very early on, um, wrote about gay people and responded to letters in positive ways. So she was one of the first national figures in the 1960s to say gay people were OK. So you'll hear her in this, this clip um, talk about um, a letter someone wrote to her about neighbors they didn't like. And it's clear from the letter that these are gay people who are neighbors. And this is a bit of an That's Abby. Um, in the 1960s, she had that hairdo forever. There was a, a column that Wendy wrote. Uh, this is the one who complained about the new neighbors next door, a strange man and a couple. Well, the letter was, this is a nice neighborhood. And uh, we're very disgusted with the, these types. And what could we do to improve the neighborhood? And my answer was, you could move. <laughs> <laughs> How much of an impact do you think you've had as one person on this issue? Uh, I think I was the, well, I was saying with the first, I was one of the first person on a national level that wasn't gay. I wasn't defending myself. I was defending everyone's right to be themselves, gay, straight, no matter. And that was in the 19, beginning of the 1950s. It was, it took, people tell me it took a lot of guts. But I was happy to have a platform such as I had. I was so lucky. 
to be able to sit with people like the Abbey and Ed Watkins. Um, and I knew I was lucky at the time, but I, I, I actually, I, I thank my 30-year-old self every day for having done this, because um, my 30-year-old self gave me a career um, at this late stage of life. Dear Abby was one of my favorite interviews because she was an icon to me. She was like Ellen DeGeneres of her generation. And I remember pulling up to her house in Beverly Hills. She lived in a, a, a French Second Empire thing. The mansard roof and big double height double doors. And I rang the bell and went, she's the door, but dear Abby, who's all of four foot nine, maybe five feet tall. And she's wearing lavender hostess pajamas. Nobody wears hostess pajamas anymore, but they did then. She was wearing lavender hostess pajamas and pink fluffy slippers. Um, and all made up with her hair roll. She was just so lovely and kind and, and, and put me at ease. Abby was one of the few people who I, I had to agree to submit the final transcript to my final edited piece to um, before I used it. Um, otherwise, I didn't. Um, and the only thing she made me change was that she didn't want me to say she was wearing pink fluffy slippers. So Abby used a sense of humor with, with her column. And humor was an important part of the movement. A lot of people in the movement, despite the gravity of the situation, used humor. Even during the AIDS crisis, people used humor. Two of my favorite people who used humor in the movement were Barbara Gettys and Kay Lahusa. This clip I'm going to play for you is something they did um, uh, in the 19, it was 1971, uh, the American Library Association Convention in Dallas. They were trying to get attention for what they were doing there. They did a, um, a bibliography of all the gay books, gay um, related books that were available at the time. It wasn't a lot of books. Um, and they decided they, they had a booth on the convention floor. You've all been to conventions. There are booths on the convention floor. People get to visit. So they had a booth about gay books. But Nobody came to the booth. So um, they put out flyers, they put out posters, nobody cared. So they were trying to figure out how to get um, uh, attention for what they were doing. Let me see exactly where I'm setting it up then. Okay, so they had a lot of fun fighting for, for rights, and they were very, very inventive. So that's Barbara Giddings and Kayla Hoosen. I'll tell you the story about the dinosaurs after you listen to the book. Barbara's on. Barbara's on the far side, Kay's on the left. Kay's still alive, she's in here. Um, I speak with her right now. But we decided to bypass books and show gay love live. <laughs> so we called it Hug a Homosexual. <laughs> and we stripped it down to the bare gray curtains, That's and we had a sign up men only at one end and women only at the other, and we stationed ourselves, same sex all four kisses. of us under the signs, to give free, mind you, free, same-sex kisses and hugs. Well, let me tell you, the aisles were jammed. <laughs> <laughs> and Life Magazine was there. Life that Magazine photographer was there. Two D Dallas television stations had sent camera crews. Right, the and lights people were going on. Oh, very intimidated, yes. The lights <laughs> were on, and all these people jammed in the aisles, craning their necks to see the action, but nobody wanted to take part. So we did the action. We kissed and embraced each other for two hours. We handed out copies of the bibliography. We called out encouragement. We kissed and hugged each other some more. Alma Routsong was an absolute peach. She and I were on the female end, and a couple of the men were on the other. We did all this ourselves. We had, that really put so us there we were on the 6 o'clock news in the library, and again, we were living. They said, well, we have all these famous authors here, and all they cover is this kissing book. <laughs> they put us on the 6 o'clock news. They put us again on the 11 o'clock news, and again the next morning. This was news. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dallas. Dallas. <laughs> Dallas. It was wonderful. And it really... It, our spirits soared because we, you know, really the booth also had uh, a message that was useful in any arena, and that is that gay people are not willing anymore to be subject to a special double standard. If, if we we are we should have the same right to express our affection publicly as heterosexuals have, no more but no less. Barbara and Kay were the best interview I think of anybody I knew. I don't know if you've had this experience when you when you do an oral history with someone who's an incredible storyteller, you just want to go back and get more. Um, and that was one of the things actually I had, had to do with this book. People ask me over and over again, why didn't you interview so-and-so or so-and-so or so-and-so? Why isn't this person in your book? 
Some people were terrible storytellers. Um, Harry Hay, he co-founded the Madison Society in 1950. Harry would not, <laughs> he was, he couldn't corral Harry. Um, I, I, I pre pressed record and then it was Harry for 90 minutes, almost uninterrupted the whole time. What I needed from Harry was, how did you found the, the, the Madison Society? He wasn't interested in telling that story. Um, and I was really pissed off at him by the end of the interview. And the book, his interview was useless. It turns out it's actually not totally useless for the podcast. His, uh, we have an episode coming up with him in this season. <coughs> um, but unlike Harry Hay, Barbara and Kay were extraordinary in their storytelling. And so I went back a couple of times. I have, I think, nine hours of tape with Barbara and Kay. Um, because they're great to tell stories. Uh, and you hear Barbara's voice. Fantastic voice. So we, I played for you some some big stories, some smaller stories. Um, uh, and some of the, some of this is public history, some of it's personal struggles. The last clip I'm going to play for you, and then I'll be glad to take questions, is from Vito Russo. Um, and Vito, Vito is one of the most significant players in the movement. Um, he happened to have witnessed the Stonewall Uprising, although he didn't get involved then. He got involved after a, a, a raid that occurred in March of 1970 in the Snake Pit Bar, um, which I don't think would have been as good a symbol as Stonewall, which is a great name. But the Snake Pit Bar was a bigger raid. Um, it was more memorable because a guy jumped, uh, an immigrant jumped out of the window of a police station after he'd been arrested uh, at the Snake Pit and was impaled on the fence. Um, he had to be cut out from the fence. He survived. So that's when Vito got involved in the movement. Vito, was a co-founder of ACT UP and a co-founder of GLAD, the Game Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Um, he was the first person I interviewed for the book, because I knew he was ill. Uh, so I interviewed him in Chelsea, just a few blocks north of where I live, and almost across the street from where I had just gotten tested, or just found out that I would be just a the clinic, the public clinic. Um, Vito was already sick, and he cared for his partner, who had died from AIDS. And he was very reflective. Uh, when he spoke. He said that he wanted to survive AIDS, in part so he could be around to kick people's asses for the failings in dealing with the crisis. But he was also thinking about his place in history. Um, let me play this clip for you, and I think I may have given away the story because I was supposed to play the clip first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me play this one. That's Vito Russo. When I found this picture of Vito, I couldn't, I only knew Vito as, as uh, what I thought of as a middle-aged man, which is like 20 years younger than I am now, um, after he was sick. And I, I looked at his picture and thought, who is that, that kid? Um, and that's Vito Russo. And here's Vito in, in, in uh, living voice. I find it interesting, from what I know about the, uh, the history of the gay movement, that there always have been and there will always be people who are willing to put their lives on the line for these ideas. Starting from Germany in the turn of the century in 1895 around and then into the early teens and 20s, there were a group of people in Germany headed by Magnus Hirschfeld who were willing to put their lives on the line. They were willing to make a movie called Different from the Others, which the Nazis seized and burned. That in the 1940s and the 1950s, there were the Harry Hayes and the Barbara Giddings and the Managing Society. And then in the 60s, gay liberation. It's the more radical issues that I think are still going to be fought over. Whether gay people have a right to adopt children, get married, get married, teach in the public schools, which they do now, you know. But be open about it. Right. And those battles are battles that are going to be fought long after you and I are gone. But you have to make a contribution while you're here. I mean, that's been my whole life is to leave my book behind. That I know after I'm dead, that book is going to be on a shelf someplace. And what I have to say will reach people. And the things I've written. You know, because it's like, what's it, who was the person who said that? Pedro Almodovar. He said, the thing is, is you can't regret your life, otherwise why did you live? What was the point of having a life if you didn't say something or do something that was going to survive after you're gone? And that's the way I feel about it. I mean, I really feel the reason why I'm here is so that I could leave this book and these articles so that some 16-year-old kid who's going to be a gay activist in the next 10 or 15 years is going to read them and take carry the ball from there. And that'll happen. 
happened with me. Mm -hmm. Harry Hay passed the ball to the machine, and they passed the ball to us. And you'll pass it on. Mm -hmm. So I was 21 when I was working as a temp at Harper and Row, now Harper Collins Publishers, opening <coughs> envelopes um, that had order forms for books. In those days, it was called special sales. You could tear out a coupon and send it in with a check. And I took the staple out and put the check in one pile and put the order form in the other. Um, Vito was published by Harper and Row, and during lunch hour, I'd seen his book in one of the editor's offices. It had just been published. And I was not positive, but I wasn't really out. And I saw Vito's book in a homosexual and said that. Um, and I read his book. Um, so I was one of those people he left that book for. And then that was 1980 or 81. And then seven years later, I started to work on it. So I feel like Maggie Sirchfeld handed the ball to Harry Hay, actually handed the ball to Henry Gerber in 1924, handed the ball to Harry Hay in 1950, and then on to people like Vito, who then handed the ball to me. And in a way, I get to now hand the ball off to those of you, at least in this work, Marina, uh, people who will be doing this work going forward, and you may have the opportunity uh, to mine your own archive 30 years from now, or 40 years from now, um, to tell the story of your generation. So, you know, the story is particularly meaningful to me. Um, so, I feel like carry on his legacy. And I'm guessing most of you have never heard of his book. Um, it's called The Cellular Closet. And uh, by telling his story now, you get to hear about this book and go back and find it. Um, so, it's a great, uh, it's a great privilege for me to tell these stories and also to share them with you. So I'm happy to take questions now. Um, I'm also very good at asking myself questions. I knew it would elicit tears. I thought it would. Um, and it was 
Damian Martin, whose partner Henry Hedrick had just died. And I don't remember now exactly what the question was. I, I, I heard it on the tape, but I forgot. But I thought, well, I'm not going to have a, a chance to ask this question again. And if he doesn't want to answer the question, we don't. And it led to this extraordinary conversation about how he met. What he said was um, that he really didn't want to live after Henry died. And he talked about shopping for the last suit when he could bury him. And if I hadn't asked that question, he wouldn't have had the chance to say that. So my rule of thumb is ask him. And if someone doesn't want to tell you, they'll tell you. And there was a moment interviewing a lesbian couple for my long, I did a book called um, Together Forever, a gay and lesbian couple shared a secret for less than happiness. And I was interviewing a lesbian couple who had been together 50 years. And I was taking them through their first dates. And they got up to, and then we hold, held hands. And I said, and then what? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember the woman's name, but she was in her 70s or 80s, and she just shoulders back, chest <laughs> up, and she said, We don't talk about that. <laughs> but there was another couple I interviewed, <laughs> two women in Tennessee. They were young, they were in their 30s, and we weren't even five minutes into the interview when they were telling me about their first sex together. And it, well, they were as rapid as anyone could be. And, uh, uh, and actually, we were eating lunch by then. I remember yeah. laughing. Yeah. I thought I was going to choke on my soul. It, it was just as grand as it could So if, if, ask the question. <laughs> yes? What, if anything, have you learned about interviewing by listening back to these interviews you did 30 years ago? Ask the question. Mm -hmm. um, this, I, I was telling Marina earlier that in my transcripts, because I transcribed all my interviews, I said, and I've got terrible tendonitis, so I don't transcribe. I, I wrap my arms in uh, ace bandages every night. It doesn't, it doesn't say it causes so much pain. Um, I, there are notes to myself. I guess myself, 30 years later, <laughs> how could you not have the answers? <laughs> uh, I interviewed a woman, uh, Nancy May, who was married to a gay man in the 1960s who got very involved in the movement. Um, and I never asked her. I just said, this is the place where you should have asked her why she married Bill May, knowing that he was gay. I didn't ask it. Um, she's still alive. I'm going to call her and ask her. <laughs> um, the other was to let, but I knew then to just to, to be quiet and let people answer. And when I do interviews now, I often keep my finger over my lips and keep my mouth shut. Um, but also, I didn't know that I would be doing these interviews for a podcast, so there are times I step on my step on answers. Um, so I learned that. I, I learned talk less. Um, I did an interview just the other day. And it's not it's something that's not a conversation. Um, but you also have to be willing to take the interview where it goes and then come back to your questions and make sure you come. Um, I also learned, looking back, that I was pretty good at doing interviews. Um, Marina, and then back. Thank you. I guess I just want to thank you so much. I benefited so much from your work. Uh, I was wondering if you interviewed uh, people in ACLOC as it was growing as an organization and how you saw it grow and change. I didn't do many interviews. Um, I interviewed, um, so I act up as a piece of the story. Um, I interviewed uh, Anne Northrup. Um, Larry Kramer, Peter Russo, and I think that may have been it. Yeah. Um, I was also, as I look back, in denial about what was happening at the time. Oh, and I also interviewed um, a woman in Alaska, whose name escapes me at the moment, who got involved with AIDS activism in Juneau, Alaska. Wow. Um, it's in the original book. I think she's a little bit in the, in the second book. Um, I prefer the original Making History. Yeah. Um, because each person gets a full chapter. In the second edition, I interwove the stories and cut them way down. Um, so I recommend you get making history of uh, the print edition of three new books um, or the new ebook. So I interviewed a woman in Alaska about what she uh, she got involved in teaching people about AIDS and, and safe sex. She was watching as AIDS spread across the country, and then as it, as the AIDS crisis receded, and she realized it wasn't going to hit Alaska the way it hit the rest of the country, she got involved in gay activism all of her experience to gay work. She said, if I could stand in front of a crowd and show people how to use a condom using a banana for a dildo, I can certainly talk about fighting for my rights. Um, she might wait around for office. 
Um, so I didn't interview that many people um, around AIDS. Um, I shouldn't say that. Tom Cassidy is one of the episodes uh, that I did. And he was dying uh, when I interviewed him. Uh, who else did Randy Schultz. So I, yeah, I interviewed a lot of people. Uh, we'll have Randy in season six if we're listening to season six. This season, uh, our next season, cover from 1897 Magnus Hirschfeld. Um, this season will end in January with um, the Eve of the Stonewall Uprising. We'll pick up next spring with the Eve of the Stonewall Uprising and take you through the early 70s. And then probably season six, if there is one, we'll go back to taking samples, a sample of the archive. And Randy Schultz will be one of the other seasons. Randy was impossible. He interrupted his interruptions. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to cut tape. Helen DeGeneres was brutal. She never finished a sentence. Okay. Um, never. So if you listen to the episode, she never finished the sentence. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Marina and Amy. Uh, I have so many questions. Uh, I one. loved your interview with Ellen. She was also wearing pajamas. A lot of people wear pajamas when people wear houses. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my question. <laughs> <laughs> and we're done at 7.30, is that? Or 7.30? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to leave at 7.30, you can go. At 7.30, I'll we'll finish up at 7.35. So, hostess pajamas are not the same as pajamas. Hostess pajamas are pajamas that women wore for co if they were having a cocktail party in their house. So it was an elegant cup. So what, the reason Abby didn't want me to mention the fluffy slippers is that you wouldn't have worn pink fluffy slippers with, with, with lavender hostess pajamas. You'd wear them with fancy shoes that were appropriate for hostess pajamas. Uh, heels. Too, not flat uh, yeah. But she was home and she wanted to be comfortable. But she did have her hair done that morning and her makeup. Um, Everything. <laughs> now, I didn't take pictures, so I don't have. I have one picture from all the interviews that I did, and it was taken by Kay Mahusen of me with Barbara Gittles. You can see it on the website. Um, and Kay was originally going to be in the photo. She was setting it up so that the three of us could be in it. And we were just listening to the interview with Barbara and Kay. She's setting up a photo, and, and Barbara's saying, it's too awkward to have you in the photo. <laughs> so it's just a photo with me and Barbara Giddens in 1989. Uh, but I don't have a picture of Mr. Abbey. Um, the reason Ellen was in her pajamas is that she'd completely forgotten I was coming to interview her. And I rang the buzzer for her house, and she said later that she thought that I was um, a reporter from the National Enquirer trying to get an interview with her. Um, when she realized who I was, she let me in, but she was in her jam because she had a nap. Okay, that wasn't my question. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm starting to get to it. I I don't know which question to ask though, but but well, I wanna know like like you should you should have someone this is a comment. You should have someone do And the bits and pieces 
are the bits and pieces they are because of what I recorded and things that we're able to pull out of other archives. Um, so a lot of it's accidental, and now some of this is a very purposeful season. We still can only tell bits and pieces. Amy? Um, you talked about how the Arcades Foundation played a role in making the first season happen. Um, can you tell us more about how the work is supported? Yes. And actually, I see now a whole like set of foundations at the bottom of your website. But hearing it's like amazing to hear you talk about oh, season four, five, and six are going to. There must be some some stability, which I know is hard for things like this. So. Um, I don't think there's stability, but I'm talking about stability. <laughs> um, we started out on a shoestring. I got my initial grant was for um, uh, forty-five thousand um, dollars. Forty-five thousand. Uh, to do the first season, um, and that included hiring an executive producer and an engine, audio engineer, building the website. We did it on a real shoestring, and then 15% of that, or 10% of it, went to our fiscal sponsor. I need nothing. Fiscal sponsors, if you're not a 501c3 yourself, you can get somebody to be your 501c3 for you. Listen to Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network is my fiscal sponsor. So I had to learn the whole language of of the nonprofit world and funding. Um, I've had guardian angels who have, um, in terms of, of the money, uh, who have heard the work, loved the work, and said, let's figure out, figure out how we can fund you. It doesn't mean that they just threw money at us, because then I have to learn how to write grants, uh, grant proposals. So we're now at a point where I have people who work with me, who I pay, and I have to raise money to be able to pay them. So. Um, it's it's not a nightmare because it's not my profession, <laughs> um, and I've had to learn how to be a fundraiser and write grant write grant proposals to fund this work. Um, the work speaks for itself, so that helps a lot. But you still have to ask for money. So one of the things I really struggled with was that my advisory board and my executive producer said we have got to ask our listeners to be part of this because it's important for the funders to see that you have. We're involved. So in our off season when we had time, I learned all about funding platforms and how you design it and all of that. So now we've involved our donor, our listeners. And I was so embarrassed to ask for our listeners to support our work. It turns out our listeners are very eager to support our work. Um, and we've had donations from $15 to $5,000 for one donation. <laughs> um, but now that I have a much bigger operation, I have it's the cost model. Um, so uh, I, I actually had lunch the other day with someone who wants to do a podcast and he asked me about how you go about doing this. It helps to know a lot of people. It helps to be my age so I can call people I know and say, the most uh, useful subject line I have is, would welcome your advice. I wrote you one, I wrote any one of those emails <laughs> when I had the archive and wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. And I wrote to you and said, I welcome your advice. Because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and people are usually happy to give you advice. Uh, and one bit of advice I had just the other day was, don't be shy about asking for money. Uh, she said, do you have a mission? Do you have important work? And you can't be shy about it, and you can't act as if your work isn't important. So I'm just now planning an event in San Francisco. My major funder is based in Oakland. Um, and I'm going to be meeting with them to talk about the next round of funding. And they suggested I get people together in San Francisco who might be interested in supporting the podcast. So I've been asking a friend to host an event and writing to people and say, come here and let you know what I'd love you to support. And that's the challenge. Uh, but you have to do it in this work. Time for one more question. Yes. As an accidental historian, how do you talk about your trajectory and figuring out? what you ask. Obviously, you do a lot of research, and you talk about that line between question and conversation, but how did you develop that? Um, I, started by, I started doing my interviews um, as an undergraduate at Vassar College. I did my undergraduate thesis on, my background was in urban planning and architectural history. That was what I was doing. <laughs> um, and I did my undergraduate thesis on the uh, what happened to Main Street because um, and I remember taking a tip for the first time and interviewing various people who were involved in, in the destruction of Main Street Poughkeepsie, its decline and destruction. 
Um, I was interested in retail development, 19th, 19th and 20th century. So that's when I first started to learn how to ask questions. And then I did a, a, um, a master's in journalism and learned how to ask there. Um, when I started doing making the history and doing the interviews for that, I learned as I went. So um, you're having the opportunity in this master's program to learn what, what to do and what not to do. Much of what I learned was by trial and error. And it also turned out that I'm good at doing interviews. Um, and I learned a lot of it was just, just because I, I was comes naturally. And I like talking to people. And this is something that happened when I was young. Is people would ask me, how do you get people to open up to you? I remember being 15 years old at my mother's kitchen table, fresh kitchen table, in Queens, and one of my mother's friends from Canada was visiting, visiting, and she started telling me about her divorce and her abusive husband, and I remember sitting there, sitting there thinking, why are you telling me this? <laughs> and for whatever reason, people have always felt comfortable, comfortable sharing stories with them about their lives. And I don't know if you can make that up. Um, it, it, it's served me well, but it's nothing that I planned on. That's why I call myself an accidental or historian. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with your facial expressions. Um, one thing I've learned doing this work, and I remember thinking earlier oh, tonight, this is one thing I wanted to leave on the work, um, which is why I think Jerry Springer was in the room. During the, when you're taking your oral history, you want to avoid interrupting. You want to encourage people to keep talking. I have found, um, or you want people to continue talking, and you want them to know that you don't understand what they're talking about. I use facial expressions a lot. Raise an eyebrow. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> smile. And I, not everyone can raise a single eyebrow. I can. Um, so it's a pretty big smile, like yours. Um, yes. So it's a way, or I'll use hand expressions to suggest I don't know, you know, or shrug shoulders. It's a way of conveying a lot of information that you want more um, without interrupting. Um, and I, uh, or if you're really interested in what they're saying and what they're do, you look like you're really interested. Um, or if you want them to stop or finish, I raise a finger and I hand like this, and it lets people know that they're going on to without me interrupting, and they get to finish their thought as opposed to me interrupting. So that's, I have used hand gestures and facial expressions to aid in my interviews in ways that I didn't realize early on. So. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I feel like I should pay all of you because this is way too much fun. <laughs> oh, we've got good tips here, right? Like, uh, recorded broadcast quality, take good field notes, always ask the question, and don't be shy about asking for money, right? Like, One more. that's basically like who needs a master's program. Like, <laughs> One more. Very aware of the background noise <laughs> yeah. um, because it's really hell to, to edit audio when you've got an air conditioner going um, or there's street traffic. Um, so be aware of your surroundings because you can use these tapes later. I have no idea how to work. Um, yes, one more question. Yeah. So we are trying to avoid the background noise. <laughs> yes. You're You know, I, I interview people in their homes, so it's, it's good to find a room where there's a lot of furniture. Um, and also, the hotel mic goes a long way to screen out the other noise, and then you have the echoey sound in the room. So I still use a hotel mic. Or my executive producer comes with me, she won't talk about it. And you can ask more questions when I'm Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to have our open house here next week. And two weeks from today, uh, Doug Boyd is going to be talking about all of the ethical dilemmas that come up when we put an interviews online in a mass scale. So it's actually kind of related. Yeah. Um, thank you again.